intention is to a little bit tell you where we are with the, digi the digital single market, but then allow time for interaction, questions, uh, challenges that uh, you would like to, to pose uh, about where we go. Let me start by saying, uh, I think we are living a, a very complicated moment for in many respects in all parts of the world. And part of the reason why it is co so complicated, there are, of course, many geopolitical reasons. But there's one reason that is very relevant to the discussion we are going to have today. It's the so-called new industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, the era of the robots, the era of the big data, call it as you like. Uh, so the tremendous shift we are seeing in terms of uh, value proposition, in terms of uh, the workforce in terms of uh, 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 companies uh, that have success, companies that uh, fail, and uh, the tremendous pressure on all uh, the traditional uh, uh, values in society and uh, the traditional structure of the economy to change. And this digital disruption, the internet disruption, more or less happens at the speed of light, uh, which uh, if you are an internet uh, savvy person does not really surprise you. Uh, but still, I must say, I'm, I remain always very surprised uh, to see how quickly things happen. And of course, for institutions, for uh, people that have to deliver stability in terms of the message, it's, it's a problem to cope with all this. Because on one side, you are tempted to react, maybe to overreact. On the other side, uh, maybe the rational response is to let it go. But the, in, the, in the meantime, there are efforts on the, in the society, in, there are efforts in the economy. So it's a complex uh, uh, process, uh, and there are no easy answers. Uh, but it's also clearly a land of opportunity. Uh, it's a land of opportunity in terms of economic growth. It's a land of opportunity in terms of new jobs. There are so many vacancies in ICT that cannot be filled. And, uh, would you find this uh, uh, a sort of paradox that on one side, especially looking at the south of Europe, we have so many unemployed young people, and at the same time, more than a one million job in ICT that can not be filled. So there's a clear mismatch in terms of skills, what the population can deliver is, uh, and what companies are requesting, I mean, especially young people, to do. So that's an enormous challenge, but an enormous opportunity. Take the health sector. There's, there's a sort of promise out, of there, out there that with personalized <coughs> medicine, not only, I mean, uh, the type of response to help your personal health uh, 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 management or your health problems will be absolutely personalized in terms of drugs, in terms of what to do, but also the savings that will be associated are enormous because there's not anymore the medicine trial and error, there's not anymore the side effects. Uh, of course, I'm speaking about uh, maybe cuckoo land, but I mean, there are, I mean, signs in what we do in our personalized medicine program uh, that are really going in this direction. I, yesterday, I mm, presented the brain project, the U human brain project of Europe, one billion investment, and basically, through big data, supercomputing, the neuroscientists are now able to more or less map every neuron of our brain and light up particular areas of the brain. That means, in perspective, an enormous potential of curing illnesses that today cannot be cured. Good news not only for us as uh, human beings, but for us as citizens, because that means less cost and that means more personalized health care. Let's take governments, I mean, with the e-democracy, with the e, uh, um, interaction with the administration, you have much more quick response from the administration, less queues or no queues anymore, and uh, probably you get what you need. Um, again, challenges. Think about all the debate that's going on about false news and what a democratic system should do about this. But enormous opportunities. 
Think about uh, industry. I mean, with the era of robots, uh, you basically have a much more uh, uh, clean and uh, uh, human environment uh, in factories. <coughs> Many of the tasks today done by the humans can be automated, so less accidents uh, in, in the workplace, uh, a, a much more interesting job. But of course, we will need much more IT specialists and less people doing repetitive job. Think about our uh, 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 transportation system. Automatic drive uh, saves an immense amount of fuel, which means, uh, and looking also at the possibility of combining automatic drive with electric propulsion, it means much cleaner uh, uh, cities in terms of the quality of the air, but much less traffic, much less accidents. So uh, an impressive change in our quality of life. But again, there are challenges because, I mean, with automatic drive, maybe some people have to change their job from, from driving trucks or cars to actually being software engineers. Uh, and that this is a job of a generation to change in this respect. So in a nutshell, uh, the digital single market, it's a, it's a sort of land of opportunity for Europe. It's the positive story about Europe. It's probably what the citizen think <coughs> when thinking about Europe would expect Europe to do, to deliver to them some value added. And of course, if we are able to tell the citizen, you will be cured better, there will be less traffic, there will be more job opportunities, this is a story that is not even necessary to sell. It's sell by itself. But as I said, and I alluded to this, there are many challenges because we are far from being there. 30% uh, of the European population is still not internet savvy. Uh, we don't have those skills we are talking about. Uh, still, uh, I mean, our infrastructures are way beyond what would be needed to have autonomous drive around. Because of course, if you think about autonomous drive and uh, you need 100% high quality mobile coverage because the car has to be always in contact with other cars and the rest. So don't think that you can have suddenly a drop in quality of uh, the mobile coverage. These are not the mobile networks we know today. So there's a tremendous challenge for Europe in terms of investments. Now, if I can start with the bottom of the value chain, which is the connectivity, I, I mean, a digital society is a connected society. No connectivity, no services. Uh, we have estimated, we have presented our plan for connectivity. We have said, uh, uh, look, uh, our estimate, and if you have a better one, I'm happy to discuss it. It's more than 500 billion euros are needed to realize what we call a gigabit society, which is an hyper-connected society with a gigabit connectivity by the way, there are communities here in Ireland that started this stream of the gigabit connectivity, so well done. Uh, everywhere, no matter where you are. That means, for example, 5G for mobile. That means super high speed to the home, which could be, I mean, uh, enhanced cable infrastructure, fiber to the home, but we are talking about the gigabit plus. To do that, 500 billion euros uh, are needed. And when you look at Ireland and how much effort and good effort the government is posing in filling in the gap between the various areas, I mean, especially looking at the rural part of the country, it shows that uh, it's not simple to get all uh, this capital that is needed together. Now, uh, how much collectively uh, public funds can do for these 500, 600 billion euros which are needed? I would say 10%, bets are open. So most of this money uh, has to come from private capital. So uh, when looking at connectivity, clearly rules are very important to convince uh, private investors that Europe is a land of opportunity. Ireland is a land of opportunity. Spain is a land of opportunity. Germany is a land of opportunity. So country factors matter, but also, I mean, stability of the regulatory system matters. That's why we have proposed a brand new European communication 
electronic communication code. So also symbolically the same code all over Europe uh, with the, having the core idea that of course one size fits all is not the answer. The answer that is good <coughs> for fostering more broadband in Ireland is not necessarily the same answer that should be in the south of Spain. But at the same time, uh, the basic ground rules, the basic ground reflex should be the same. At the same time, I mean, regulators have to work together to make sure that the result is the right one. And I think listening also to private investors, Europe stands a real chance to attract capital. And of course, our aim is to say, by 2025, uh, the gigabit society must be a reality. Our highways, our main roads should be 100% connected <coughs> with the very high speed connectivity because we want to get there. We want to have the low carbon economy. We want to have uh, uh, autonomous drive. So that's the ground rule. I mean, the things had to work. It's, I mean, connectivity, and that's what we have done. Of course, crawling up in the value chain, you have the issues about uh, how uh, uh, data exchanges are organized. In this respect, we have been working for the same rule when it comes to privacy protection, the general data <coughs> protection rule, which is now adopted and is in its implementation. And it's nice to say that the same rules that are in Poland are in Portugal, because then again, companies uh, can establish their data centers, not based uh, will the Polish rule or the uh, Portuguese rule be different, or when and where location gives the best result. So allows for consolidation of data centers. And Ireland is a big beneficiary of uh, uh, this kind of uh, single market vision about rules. We have uh, worked on the new e-privacy directive, which is about the, say, communication channel privacy. I mean, you, mm, we will present uh, the new rules in uh, January, and also will present um, a much larger reflection on data. So who owns the data? Who has the access to uh, access the data? Again, let's take a connected car, an autonomous car. Is the car manufacturer the owner of the data? Uh, what is the right of third parties, o OEMs, or third parties, developers, or app developers, to have access to those data? What is the right of government agencies to have uh, part of access on, in part on aggregated form of those data? The same for health sensor, like my watch. Uh, who, who owns the data? You, you are inclined to say, I own the data, you own the data. Is it really so? Hmm. Look the fine prints, you tell me. Uh, um, who's the, who has the, again, the possibility to use the data? Uh, this is a very crucial issue for all the businesses, for all the startups. So you don't expect us that uh, we are legislating at the speed of light. On the contrary, expect us to be very prudent about all this. Expect us to ask a lot of questions to you all. What do you think? If, do we have a problem about the ownership of the data? Do we have a problem about liability of the data? If my autopilot uh, gets some sort of uh, uh, track as, as the sky and uh, just crashes, uh, that's uh, something that happened, uh, it crashes into the car, uh, into the track, sorry, who's liable? The data sensor that may be misread, the software company, maybe the driver that should not have watched the movie but uh, would be, should have been a bit more vigilant. So these are the challenges of the future. And the same with robots in surgery rooms or robots in, uh, in factories. Who has the responsibility for uh, something that goes wrong? Uh, it should be not the society, the control society of the things that should go wrong, but at the same time, these are questions that we should ask uh, and should start to give us uh, collectively answers on how we want to do things in Europe. One thing that's important, we must do things together in Europe. Because again, imagine if Ireland would have its own definition of this autonomous drive and its own rules about uh, access to data. then. Uh, the software for the car would be custom, customized for 
the Irish market. The app developers will have to do things for the, app, uh, for the Irish market. And maybe the same app developer will not be able to sell the same apps in Germany. If Germany would have its national law about autopilots or the use of software and, and the rest. So these are things where absolutely, I mean, there's no other uh, possibility than work together. And I'm not saying this as a passionate European. Of course, I am a passionate European. I'm saying this out of necessity. Uh, uh, take something I will uh, discuss this evening, uh, supercomputers. Europe is nowhere in supercomputing. The first supercomputing in the top uh, 100 of the world of Europe is number 12. The rest is all uh, uh, Chinese or US supercomputers. Well, supercomputers are the, the factories of the future. With big data, you need supercomputers. If you want to understand the human brain, you need a supercomputer. If you want to have a personalized drug, you need a supercomputer. If you want to design a car, you need a supercomputer. So can Europe afford to do that, to be the last? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I mean, of course, in, like in aeronautics, we have uh, not the uh, Irish planes, the German planes, the Italian planes. We have, uh, I mean, a European effort to be competitive in the aeronautics market. The same in supercomputing. These are two big things, even for large member states, to think we can have our own solution. And those member states that tried the supercomputing uh, national road miserably failed. So uh, take supercomputing, take quantum technology, take artificial intelligence. The research effort is too big for a single member state. So again, whether you have your own ideas about Europe, whether I have my own ideas, it doesn't really matter. This is an area where we need to work together. So the other dimension of the digital single market is uh, the competitiveness agenda. So there's one dimension which are the rules, the other dimension is the competitiveness. So we have uh, launched our competitive agenda, which is about uh, digitizing the European industry. So trying to see what is the best route towards having, especially traditional industries in the construction sector, in the manufacturing sector, embracing the digital revolution. What it means, what it means in terms of what they kind of uh, skills in the workforce they have uh, to acquire, what kind of mindset, what kind of technology things about, for instance, IoT in the construction sector. Internet of things will be very relevant. Drone technology will be very relevant. So we are now working with all the industrial platforms of Europe uh, and trying to say, let's work together. Let's have a common agenda on things like artificial intelligence, robotics, and the rest. We have launched uh, a project that we call uh, the Internet of the Humans, which is the Internet, uh, the, the Internet how we want to see it in 10 years from now. So now we are in the Internet of Things. Uh, we would like to test the ideas of everyone especially the ideas of small SMEs, innovators in uh, research centers, how the internet should look like from a more human-centric point of view, which means, for instance, integrating all things that now we see, the augmented reality. Now, your kids know Pokemon, the Pokemon uh, exercise, the Pokemon game. Think about the commercial possibilities with such a thing, or also the uh, uh, social possibility with, with augmented reality. The same goes for enhanced use of vision or enhanced use of uh, uh, the possibilities in scanning the environment. I mean, so there are many, many things we can do. And think also what kind of response a more human-centric internet can give to challenges such as privacy. Because, of course, if the internet is designed around uh, you as a sphere and all applications recognize what you want to do, what you don't want to do, it's much easier, I mean, to decide uh, which is the level of interaction you want. It's a little bit like the physical society. So next generation internet is another thing we have launched. Uh, we have a strong partnership with the industry on cybersecurity. We have a strong partnership on, uh, with the industry on robotics. Next year, we are going to launch a large reflection on artificial intelligence. 
what it means, what are the opportunities, what are the ethical considerations about artificial intelligence. And last, uh, but not least, by far the first is skills. So uh, there will be no digital society that functions without a skilled for, for workforce, we said it. Uh, so we need much more. Uh, tomorrow we will launch our uh, grand uh, coalition for skills and jobs, digital skills and jobs, where industry, uh, universities, other education institutions will work together with us to create uh, a group uh, that really works seriously on a skill agenda, digital skill agenda. And we are also up uh, for new ideas that could come uh, today or whenever you like, post ideas, on how to in really target directly people that are in need uh, of having skills. We are thinking, for instance, about uh, a European voucher scheme for skills, <laughs> where really we can get, I mean, especially young people, uh, uh, working uh, in uh, in uh, uh, IT environment uh, and maybe getting credits for this while studying. So things like this we are uh, now testing and hopefully we will launch quite quickly. So uh, skills is really, I mean, uh, probably the challenge number one looking at the next wave of uh, what the digital single market could mean. So let me finish by saying uh, I more believe uh, that the digital single market is the land of opportunity for Europe rather than the land of risks and uncertainty. I think, however, we must be not just uh, saying nice things, but also discussing what are the challenges and how to tackle the challenges. But one thing I'm sure, it's an area where probably we have not done enough to convince everyone that this is a real opportunity for all of us. So I think debates as today, I mean, whatever we can do to push, because these are all digital savvy people in the room. Uh, uh, so I'm not trying to convince you that this is important. I'm just trying to stimulate a discussion on what needs to be done and the priority. So any idea, any debate uh, would be really welcome. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.